Okay, so then welcome to the course today. Um, today, as announced yesterday, will only be a quite short lecture um, on homogeneous coordinates, which is one way, one alternative way uh, to using the um, Euclidean coordinate frame, which is frequently used in robotics to express transformations. And that's something which all the students of last year said it would be nice to get an introduction on that. And therefore, we have a short, whatever, 20 to 30 minute probably introduction to homogeneous coordinates and what they are used for, what we can do with that, why they are a kind of a useful tool for us. And you will see those homogeneous coordinates, especially transformations expressed in homogeneous coordinates um, throughout the lecture a few times so that you know what you're going to see. After that, we will have in one hour exercise um, kind of a introdu short introduction to MATLAB or Octave, uh, which we will use in the course, and then directly exercises with this homogeneous coordinate that you see here. So after half an hour of lecture, approximately one hour of tutorial, and then from next week on, we continue as planned every Monday. It's a lecture, and um, Tuesdays from 10 to 12 is the tutorial. Okay, <coughs> so let's start. Why are we, why, are, why do I claim that it makes sense to leave the uh, Cartesian world? Um, the reason for that is that a lot of bearing-only sensors, that means sensors which do not measure the distance to obstacles, but just the, um, the orientation where an object is. Such, for example, a camera. The camera doesn't give you any distance information by counting the pixels or by knowing which pixel corresponds to which angle you can estimate at which angular orientation an object that you perceive is located. But from a single image, you can at least, if you don't integrate any background knowledge or any additional information, cannot tell how far a point is away. And that means that the camera generates a projection of the 3D world onto a 2D image plane. So it's just a, it's a projection of any 3D point, object, whatever it is, onto a 2D image. And um, the Euclidean geometry is actually suboptimal to describe that. We can do that, so it, it works. It's nothing which kind of hinders us from doing that, but it's suboptimal in the sense that the mass can get a bit complicated. So the equations for doing that are suboptimal, especially for describing the uh, central projection. That is, you have, this is probably the camera model you've learned at school. So you have one center of the projection and every point that is projected on, a on an image plane, which is parallel to the um, optical axis, go through that uh, point. And um, as I said, the Euclidean geometry, if you express all that in, uh, with Euclidean math, it can get a bit complicated. And therefore, people introduced another space, that is, or another kind of geometry, which is called projective geometry, which explicitly handles this, or is kind of well-suited to handle these projections. And as a result of that, the mass becomes easier. And therefore, it makes sense to actually look into that representation. Um, it should be noted that the projective geometry doesn't change the relation between object and space. So I mean, we, can we, we model the same relation of object in that space. Um, the only thing is that, um, as I said, that the math becomes easier. Transformations, especially, that's what we are interested in, can be handled easier um, in kind of a very nice and simple form. And that's kind of the reason why we use that. And we look especially into homogeneous coordinates. And homogeneous coordinates is uh, a coordinate system f um, used in projective geometry. And um, it has two nice advantages. The first one is that we can represent what we call points at infinity in a very nice way. Points at infinity are points which are infinitely far away, but where I know the distance. If you think of a camera, you observe an object, um, and you, you know which, to which pixel it corresponds, the object, you know the angular orientation of that object relative to, to you. But you have no idea how far it is away. And um, it can be that this point is infinitely far away. And if you think about your general representation of space with x and y coordinates, it's actually not easy to describe a point which is in, uh, infinitely far away, or points at infinity. Especially you cannot do that um, with um, an, a, a finite coordinate. So you, you can, whatever, you have an additional factor which goes to infinity, and then you take into account the angular component, and then generate a point at infinity, but that's kind of not that nice. Um, in contrast to that, the homogeneous coordinates explicitly allow us to represent points at infinity. The second thing, that's the thing which is kind of most important for us in this course here, um, 
is that we can use a single matrix to represent affine transformations. So it means um, transformations which include rotations, translations, um, shear, um, scale changes. We all can put that into a single matrix multiplication. And that's what makes it very, very easy for us to do that. If you think about the 2D geometry, you have the vector in 2D, you want to transform this vector. You could do that for rotation, so you could take a rotation matrix, multiply it with a vector, and then you got the rotated vector. But you couldn't do that with transformations. And so in the homogeneous coordinates, the whole uh, transformations we can actually, or not the whole transformations, but um, the uh, projective transformations, which include also the affine transformations, which include also translation rotations, can be nicely put into a single matrix. And that means by single, simple matrix multiplications, we can express coordinate transformations, which is really nice, and that's actually the main reason why we do that. So although points to infinity are very important, um, this is nothing which will be densely covered in this course, uh, but the last point here, that's something which we will use frequently in this course, um, and therefore it makes sense to know what homogeneous coordinates are. Okay, let's go a bit more concrete. What is a homogeneous coordinate? The representation, representation of x of a geometric object, it's say just a point for now, is homogeneous if x and a scalar factor, lambda multiplied with x, represent the same object, given that lambda is, is not zero. So we have some vector x, and x as well as any scalar multiplied with x should be exactly the same object. So that's just the definition. One example for that is we have a point x which has three coordinates, u, v, w. If u can be expressed as w times a new variable x, v can be expressed as w times a new variable y, then this point and this point x, y, 1 represent exactly the same object. Because you obtain this one over here by multiplying this term over here by 1 divided by w. So u, v, w is equal to x, y, 1 times 1 divided by w. And this is exactly the scalar factor. Okay? Okay, so what can we do with that? So this is our homogeneous vector is exactly the same equation we had before. And in, and this one corresponds to the point x, y in the Euclidean space. So if I want to go from the Euclidean space to the homogeneous space, it's sufficient to add another dimension to my vector and add a 1 down here, the new dimension I add. So for representing objects in the 2D world, which I used so far a two-dimensional vector for, I need now a three-dimensional vector. And to map from the Euclidean space to this homogeneous coordinates, I just add a new dimension, and this dimension takes a value 1. That's all I do. OK, and then I can, if I'm, I have a point in homogeneous coordinates, u, v, w over here, if I want to transform that one to the Cartesian space, I just take the last component and divide all elements by the last component. It's kind of I normalize it um, by dividing the whole vector through one divided, uh, one divided by w, therefore this value gets 1. And then I can neglect this component 1, and this gives me my point in the Euclidean space. Okay, so we can visualize this now. If this plane over here is, our, is R2, so our regular Cartesian two-dimensional space, and the three-dimensional construct here is, um, represents my um, homogeneous coordinate system. Then this R2 is just a plane at the last coordinate, so the Z coordinate equals 1, so that's 1, in that three-dimensional space. And our point X in um, the Euclidean space, say our point X, Y down here, is exactly this point, this single point in the plane. In my three-dimensional space, this represents any object that lies on this, on this line, which goes through the uh, origin of the coordinate frame, through that point x, further on. And this is exactly this, um, this lambda, this scaling factor that I add. So if my point x lies in my homogeneous space over here, that means it is exactly the same unchanged point um, down here in my uh, so kind of in R2. 
in my two-dimensional Cartesian space. And you, you may see that, that wherever this point lies on that line, it will fall exactly on this coordinate in a 2D plane. And this is why maybe you may be able to see the connection to, for example, a camera where a point, which somewhere lies on a line, gets projected on one specific point in my image plane. So if you want to map from any point on that line, we just divide all coordinates by the third coordinate. That means the third coordinate gets one. So it moves down here on that plane. And then we have our coordinate in the um, Cartesian space. So from with normalizing, we go to the Cartesian space. If you want to go from the Cartesian space to the um, homogeneous space, we just have to add a new dimension and put a one in there. Is there any question about that? Okay. As a result, the center of the coordinate frames are zero, zero and a one, another component, so whatever value I put in there, I put a two in there, it would represent the same object if I normalize it through um, uh, the first coordinates because they are zero. So zero, zero, one or zero, 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 one are the centers of the coordinate frame. And this allows us now to express points at infinity. So points which are infinitely far away. In this case, quite easy, but just taking our coordinate u and v and add a zero down here. Because if you want to map this now to the Euclidean space, we would need to divide u and v by zero. And if you, let's say, take a value which we let approach there, that means this point moves away on that, infinitively far away on that line. And so by explicitly having a zero in here, we can represent points that are infinitely far away. And um, the nice thing is that we can do that with three coordinates here, which are finite. So we don't need infinitely large values down here as we would need uh, to do that in the, um, in the Cartesian world. We can now do certain things like checking if we can express lines in a very similar way and can then easily check if lines are parallel or orthogonal um, without caring what the individual dimensions actually look like. And that's kind of a very nice property. That's what it's often used for if you work with cameras and want to take into account points which are infinitely far away. There's nothing we do here in that course, at least to, not to a great extent. And therefore, um, I don't want to go more into the details here. Um, I just want to mo look more on um, the transformations that we can we express with those homogeneous coordinates because that's something we are going to use here in that course. Okay, so the first thing we can do, um, we can also do that for 3D points. We just have a, a four-dimensional vector, which is here the additional value t. And we normalize by t, so we have u, v, w, t, and exactly the mapping to the Euclidean space. And again, if we map, map back, we have our values here. We just add one down here, and we are in our homogeneous world. So the mapping between both worlds is actually quite easy. Okay, so how can we describe transformations using this um, coordinate system? Um, I said to you before that we can express everything by a matrix transformation. Uh, the only thing is this matrix should be invertible. So we have, if we have our transformation matrix M and we multiply an actor X with M in homogeneous coordinates, we get another vector in homogeneous coordinates, X prime over here. And what I want to illustrate now that we can <coughs> actually by having a special structure in this matrix M, we can express a lot of interesting transformations um, that we cannot express with a single matrix operation in the regular Cartesian space. So we need to have a more complex transformation. And here we can nicely put that into one single matrix then express this with a single matrix. So how does this matrix look like? So assume we, have the, we are living in the 3D Cartesian world. So we have a 4D vector and therefore a 4x4 four four matrix. Over here, that's our matrix M. So this should indicate that it is a 4x4 four four matrix. And the first thing we want to do is we want to express translations um, so just pure translations in this space. That was something we couldn't do in the Euclidean space by a matrix transformation. We would have to add a vector to a vector. But we can't, um, in, the, in the Cartesian world, we cannot express this by a matrix multiplication. And this is how the matrix looks like. So our matrix M has any scale of scale factor. This doesn't matter because we are living in the, homo in the homogeneous coordinates. So this scale factor can be any value. And then 
uh, M has this form. This guy over here, this I, is an identity matrix, and especially a 3x3 three three identity matrix, so it looks like this. This value here is simply a vector of zeros, three-dimensional vector of zeros, transposed, so that's kind of um, here three, one, two, three, zero values. That's a regular one, and this vector t is a translation vector. And this translation vector is, has three components, in the translation in x, the translation in y, and the translation in z. So it exactly looks like this. And we, if we build up our matrix in this, in this way, we can multiply our transformation matrix M with any vector, we will get a new vector, it has exactly the same values, but it is translated the x component by tx, the y component by ty, and the z component by tx. Okay? And the nice thing is we can do this with a matrix operation. We don't have to add a vector as you would need to do that in the Cartesian world. So there's nothing bad about adding a vector, just to say that. But the nice thing is we can express everything here with one matrix operation. So if you combine that now with different forms of transformation like rotation matrices or different things, um, then it's inconvenient if you always have to have a multiplication and then add something. And then if you stack them or chain them all together, these uh, expressions can get a bit ugly. And um, here everything is done in matrix form. I can just multiply my matrices um, and then in this way, um, execute, for example, a large chain of transformations. Okay, so trans translation is nice, but typically we also need to rotate things in space. So what happens if we want to express a rotation um, as well, uh, want to express a rotation? So if you want to express a rotation, our matrix M looks like this. Again, we have our zero down here, we have our one here, this now is again uh, a zero vector with three elements. So here, this was the vector where the translation vector was sitting before. So this is zero, that means we don't have any translation in here. And here we have a matrix R. This R is the three by three matrix. This is a regular transformation, uh, rotation matrix as you all should know it from the um, Cartesian world. So rotating about around an axis, X, Y. In case you forgot how this rotation matrix looked like, I have one slide to remind you of how these matrices look like. So in the 2D world, it's easy. We just have one axis of rotation around we can rotate. And so if you want to rotate a vector x um, around uh, the center of our coordinate system with, uh, let's say, one angle uh, theta here, we can express this by this rotation matrix multiplied by my vector x. And the output I get from that is this rotated vector x. So even in the Cartesian world, we could use a standard rotation matrix to express rotations of, um, of vectors or of points in the 2D world. This is familiar to, everyone is familiar with this concept, right? Everyone should have heard that. Perfect. Okay, this was for the 2D case. In 3D, it gets a little bit more complicated because we have three rotation axes. You can rotate around the x-axis, y-axis, or that axis. And there are a large number of different ways on expressing transformations so all around which, which axis should I um, translate, uh, rotate first, or how, how where are the axes, or do I only have one axis, um, which can lie, have any arbitrary uh, orientation in space, or so different ways for expressing uh, rotations in 3D. There's just one way for doing this. And these are the standard transformation matrices. So this matrix over here expresses a rotation in 3D around the x axis with the uh, angle omega. So this one uh, stays constant. So here's a one in the, in, the x, in the first dimension, which represents x, because I rotate around the x-axis, so a point on the x-axis is not changed. And I have exactly the same rotation matrix I had in here um, in the two other components. And we, in a very similar way, we can do that for y and for the z-coordinate. Um, here, that coordinate is one, and here you have one in the second dimension. And this gives you three different rotations, one around the x-axis, one around the y-axis, one around the z-axis. And if I want to express any rotation in 3D, I can actually do that by with three rotation matrices. So rotation about x, y, and that, just multiplying them. And here you can already see we have three rotations. We just multiply these matrices. We get a new matrix which expresses the rotation around all three axes. That's something which worked in the Cartesian world, but only for rotations, not for translations. And in the homogeneous coordinates, we can now use this 
also taking into account um, the translations. Okay, so going back, we have for our simple rotation, as we had before, we have our rotation matrix R, which is exactly this R matrix over here or this matrix over here, depending if we are in 2D or in 3D. And that's the way I can express a rotation. And now we can actually combine both. We can take into account a translation and a rotation, and this matrix looks like this. So we have our matrix R here. This was where the identity was before when we look about translations. The translation vector here and the, the, the bottom row is not changed. This is now, has now six parameters. So we have three parameters in the rotation, three par parameters in the translation. And that's kind of a rigid body transformation or a motion transformation, however they're called. And that is the thing we will use frequently in this course. So to, for example, we have a measurement in the coordinate frame of the robot, of the sensor. We may need to compute where at this point now, given that the sensor is not mounted exactly at the center of the robot, and given that the robot is somewhere in space. So we can actually express this by multiple coordinate transformations. So first, um, from, the, in the, from the sensor frame to the center of the sensor, then from the sensor to the center of the robot, and then from the center of the robot to um, the point in the world. Depending how one expresses, we have to do then a forward step or a backward step. So um, that depends on what we actually want to compute. Um, we can, however, do more. So at least you should know what else you can do with that. So <clears throat> we can have so-called similarity transformations, which have another dimension. And this dimension scales the object. So it can make an object smaller or bigger. And this adds a scaling factor m here in front of the transformation matrix. So it's not, we cannot multiply it here in front because that would be normalized away, because then m would, one would be also not, uh, multiplied with m. Since this is not the case, uh, since we don't want that, we have to put our m here. So if we do it in that way, we can um, actually have, um, so we can actually scale an object. And we can also have affine transformations, which then have 12 parameters. Then we just have a matrix A over here, um, which has nine parameters. And these nine parameters um, also include uh, different scale parameters and also shear, so you can actually shear objects. There's nothing we are going to use here, but we can actually use this. We can use this, um, the tool of homogeneous coordinates, this coordinate frame, to express this in a very elegant way just by a, sim by a simple matrix. Then we can just multiply multiple of those matrices with each other. And this way we can chain those transformations and then take the resulting matrix, multiply a vector with this matrix, and then obtain the final transformation. Just as a no small overview in the 2D world, because it's easier to visualize, you have all the different types of transformations. So you have a simple translation. This is again here we have the identity matrix in this now two by two by two block over here, and our translation x and y. Um, we can actually mirror object at the, uh, at the y-axis, then this guy gets negative. We could do the same with the x-axis if you would like to. Um, we can have a rotation, so we have, we have our rotation matrix over here. Again, this is R. Um, we, have, we can combine the rotation and the translation, so we have the rotation matrix over here and the translation vector over here. In the 2D worlds, again, that's something we are going to use here. And then you have multiple things like scaling the objects additionally. And um, you can even have a scale difference in the different axes. If you have a different scale in X and different scale in Y, you can shear, symmetric shear, that both axes are sheared in the same way, or an asymmetric shear, this is not the case, affine transformations or general um, projections. So we can put, do all of that in this nice space. <coughs> So if we have our matrix M here, which we can do a transformation, the next nice thing is, um, is that we can actually invert our matrix to get the inverse transformation. So if I carry out a transformation by multiplying M and X, I want to kind of want to undo that operation. I can multiply the resulting vector. So with M, M to the power of minus one, X prime, give me my original vector X. That's really nice because this way I can actually also invert transformations very very nicely without needing to go into the details of the transformation, we just need to invert the matrix. Yes, please. And is our M <coughs> always invertible? M is always invertible. Yeah, so this, this results from the way you construct those matrices that you yeah. have this one over here, the zero vector here, translation goes here, and this is a rotation matrix, and rotation matrix is always invertible, and as a result of that, um, you can show that 
these, if you construct M in this way, it is always invertible. Um, yeah. The only thing you need to take care of is that matrix, um, computing the matrix product is not commutative. So it's something else if you multiply matrix M1 with M2 or M2 with M M1. So in general, these two operations will not give you the same point. Because of course, if you rotate it first around the x-axis and then around the y-axis, you get a different result than if you first rotate around the y-axis and then around the x-axis. So the order in which you conduct these matrix multiplications needs to be taken into account. And this is just different transformation that you apply. It's something else if you, or first you have this object here and I can either rotate it first and then move it somewhere in space or I can move it somewhere and then rotate it. Depending on, as I have three rotations, different results may be the output. Okay, so I said about that. And again, just to wrap that up, the, the thing which we will most use in this course here is um, expression of motions. So we have a rotation matrix with three components and a translation vector with three components. So we have six components. We express the motion of objects in um, the 3D world. Or if we are only in 2D, it's just one rotation and two translations. Exactly the same form, except that this would turn into a two by two matrix. And that's what we're going to use extensively in this course. There's no kind of black magic behind that. And I hope you, in the next hour, will, ex will explore that a bit more on your own computers uh, with Octav and Fabrizio will take care of the exercise and guiding you through that process so that you get used to this concept and, um, and feel comfortable with that. So to conclude, um, homogeneous coordinates are just an alternative representation to the Euclidean space uh, for geometric objects and it is a coordinate system which is used in projective geometry. The important thing is that I have um, objects, or geometric objects, vectors, and they represent the same, two vectors represent the same object if they, just, uh, if they are just scaled. So if I have x is equivalent to any scalar times x as long as the scalar is not equal to zero. That's kind of the, the important definition in here. And um, through this extra dimension that I have, um, a lot of my things can be represented like points and infinity. And through this extra dimension, I can also integrate rotation, translation, and all the other things you have seen here into matrix operations. Um, and in this way, I can easily chain those um, transformations. And that's the reason why we often use that. Um, if you want to know more, there are a lot of geometry textbooks or projective geometry which explain that. I actually found the Wikipedia page quite good as a, as a good introduction to read through that. There are other references to longer tutorials. Um, so if you just want to reread what I've presented here, um, that's probably the easy, I put it here because it's for you probably the easiest resource to look up, uh, although there may be better descriptions, but um, I actually found it quite nice. That's it from my side for today. Um, are there any questions about that, what you have seen here? Okay, so that's it. I hope a lot of questions will come up in the next hour when we do here the exercise. Um, yeah, then we see each other next week on Monday. Thank you very much.